In this video, I'd like to walk you through an entire headphone amplifier design. I was inspired by Douglas Self's book on audio electronics called Small Signal Audio Design, where he designed a power amplifier using only NE5532 op amps. So I thought I could do something similar, except for a headphone amplifier. So this is what I call the NEXT, the NE Extreme Headphone Amplifier. The amplifier only utilizes NE5532 op amps, 44 in total, and is designed to run from a single rail DC power supply. The resulting design is a low noise and low distortion amplifier easily capable of driving anything from 8 ohm earbuds to 600 ohm studio grade headphones with plenty of gain reserves. So let's have a look in further detail. This is a two layer PCB which I had made and partially assembled by JLC PCB. You can see all the nice looking components have been assembled by JLC PCB, for example, the capacitors and the op amps and so forth. And I myself actually assembled these resistors and that's why it looks a bit dodgy at times. I chose to assemble the resistors myself because they are extended parts of JLC PCB and I wanted to use thin film resistors instead of thick film resistors to aid with the low noise design. This is a stereo amplifier, so essentially we have a mirrored section here on the left and here on the right for the two channels left and right. So here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about. First of all, the goal of course was to design a low noise, low distortion stereo headphone amplifier using only NE5532 op amps. And this, as I said before, was inspired by Douglas Cell's power amplifier using only NE5532 op amps, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. We'll look through the analog design of the power supply, the input buffer, voltage amplification stage, or other gain stage, and the power amplifier, which is the output section. We'll also look in KiCad at the PCB design, both from the schematic, layout, and routing perspective. But first of all, here's a block diagram. There's essentially four main parts to this design. Firstly, the power supply. As I said before, this runs off a single DC rail for simplicity, so I don't have to do some AC to DC conversion, work with positive and negative rails. This simply works from a brick DC power supply, which is really convenient. The power supply generates a single 15 volt DC rail, and also has some op-amp bias generators to generate a bias voltage for all the op-amps to bias them at half the supply rail voltage. Then in the audio signal chain, starting on the left, we have an input buffer which takes the line in voltage level and presents a fairly high input impedance which is audio standard of about 10 kilo ohms. We feed that signal into the voltage amplification stage which provides us gain up to about 15 decibels and that's actually using a back sandal active volume control which I'll be explaining further in the video. Once this signal has been amplified, it is fed into a power amplifier, which consists of massively paralleled NE5532 op amps, 12 per channel in fact, and that then connects to an audio jack for the headphone output. When designing this amplifier, I pretty much had two core principles in mind. First of all, we want to decrease our resistance values to reduce the Johnson noise. So for example, instead of using a 10K resistor, I might use a 2.2K resistor, with consideration of course, to reduce the Johnson noise, because the Johnson noise essentially is this formula down here, which scales with the square root of R. Secondly, I would like to parallel op amps to reduce the noise and also enhance the driving capabilities of each section. And you can see that, for example, in this snippet down here. I've done the same op amp circuit twice and joined the outputs via these summing resistors of a small value. And this way I can enhance the driving capabilities and also reduce the noise. While designing the circuit, I ran some spice simulations using LT Spice. And these are the values I found. Remember, these are just simulation results. I'm unfortunately don't have quite that expensive test gear to test these myself, but this should be in the approximate ballpark. The input impedance, as said before, is 10 kilo ohms. Output impedance is about a tenth of an ohm, but I included a 10 ohm short circuit current limiting resistor. The bandwidth, which I specified at a minus 0.1 dB point, is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So pretty much the audio range. The gain is 15 decibels max, but that is easily changed. The equivalent input noise is specified as at minus 120 dBU. The total harmonic distortion at one kilohertz into a 150 ohm load is about a thousandth of a percent. The power consumption, just running idle, is about 2.5 watts. So now let's look at the schematic and run through everything section by section. JLC PCB is actually also the sponsor of this video, so thank you very much to them. And you can see with the SMT parts library, they have quite a few NE5032 op amps left in stock for a ridiculously low price, and that's why I could get these headphone amplifiers made fairly inexpensively. If you would like to have one of these headphone amplifiers for yourself, please go to my website at philsow.co.uk, click on contact, and leave me a quick message and I'll be in touch. So here we are in KiCad looking at the NEXT headphone amplifier schematic. Let's start off with the power supply. To generate my main 15 volts DC rail, I'm actually using this LM317 linear regulator. Now these aren't terribly efficient, but they're fairly cheap 
really easy to use, and fairly quiet. As usual, the datasheet gives us a typical application schematic, which is what I pretty much use in the final design. You can vary R1 and R2 to give you your desired output voltage. We have some protection in the form of D1 and D2, as well as some bypass capacitors at the input and output. And this datasheet tells you all you need to know about what values these need to be. The output voltage in my case is 15 volts, and the LM317 typically requires an input-output differential of about 3 volts, meaning that the input voltage has to be at least 3 volts higher than the output voltage. In addition, we also have these bias generators. Since the amplifier is designed to run off a single DC rail, and op-amps generally require two rails, positive and negative, to function, the remaining op-amp inputs actually need to be biased to half the supply voltage to ensure maximum voltage swing capabilities. So therefore, I'm actually tying all of the op-amp supply pins to VCC, which is 15 volts, and ground. Then the biasing is actually achieved using these two bias generators. These allow filtering of the bias voltages, as I'm doing here, so R69, R70 essentially form a potential divider, splitting this 15 volts in half to 7.5 volts here. But by adding C41, I'm actually filtering my supply voltage quite heavily. And I can do that because I'm using these voltage follower op-amp configurations. Also, this whole configuration, because of these unity gain voltage followers, is really unaffected by loading. Then, of course, remembering our two core principles for this op-amp design, I'm using really low value resistors, so 2.2K here, and I am sharing the outputs of my parallel op-amp sections. So I'm doing the same circuit here as here, but I'm summing the outputs using these really low value resistors. And of course, for all op-amps, I will supply a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor. Left and right channels are identical, and you'll see that a lot through the remaining design. And that's pretty much it for the power supply. Now here we have the input buffer section. Again, we have the left channel up here and the right channel down here. So let's look at one of them. Now the input buffer provides a fairly high impedance to the source, for example, your MP3 player, which is connected to the input of the headphone amplifier and prevents any loading effects for the following volume control stage. Now R1 and C1 form a low pass filter, preventing any RF from getting into the system and being audibly demodulated at a later stage. The cutoff frequency is set fairly high to about 1.6 MHz. However, the source impedance, so whatever is connected to this, will further reduce this. So if we assume a maximum source impedance of about 1 kilo ohm, this will be at about 145 kHz, which is well out of the audio band. So essentially this circuitry down here is simply an RF filter. R2 also performs the function of actually grounding this side of the capacitor without any source attached. Additionally, R2 R3 and C2 actually form a high pass filter. This sets the lower minus 3 dB frequency of the headphone amplifier, as well as the input at AC frequency, so R2 and R3 in parallel, which is roughly 10 kilo ohms. R3 also biases the op-amp inputs at half the supply voltage. V bias left was from our bias generators. C2, which is our DC blocking capacitor, prevents any DC bias voltage appearing at the source, as well as preventing any DC offset at the source appearing at the op-amp inputs. Again, the use of paralleled op-amp sections is a reoccurring theme in this design and helps to reduce the noise and increase the load driving capabilities. The outputs of both op-amps are again combined via these 10 ohm resistors. Here's the schematic of the voltage amplification stage. And don't worry if this looks a bit complicated, we're going to break it down and really try to understand how this works. Overall, this is actually called a Baxandel active volume control stage. But now let's quickly talk about what a voltage amplification stage should actually do. Essentially, this is a volume control and provides all of the voltage gain in the amplifier. The voltage gain available in, the, in this headphone amplifier can be varied anywhere from effectively completely muted to approximately 15 dB, which is about 5.6 times linear. And that's plenty for almost any application. Ideally, this control law of the volume stage should follow a logarithmic curve, as this best matches the way we hear. A simple volume control could simply be a log potentiometer where the first terminal is connected to the input, and the wiper to the output. However, these apparently logarithmic potentiometers are not truly logarithmic at all, but instead approximate a logarithmic function by using two linearly changing track resistances of differing slope. Additionally, using a passive potentiometer as the sole volume control would mean all the 15 decibels of gain would have to be applied at all times before reaching this potentiometer, as the potentiometer would act to decrease the signal level. Clearly, we require a better solution. And this is where the active Baxandel volume stage comes in, which was actually named after the late Pete Baxandel, who invented this. A simplified block diagram form of the volume control is shown here. It consists of a linear taper potentiometer of total resistance R, 
a unity gain and high impedance buffer over here, and an inverting amplifier of gain K. In this form, it is a bit hard to see how the volume control functions, so let me redraw it in a more convenient form, which is that of a potential divider. I have omitted the unity gain buffer and assumed it is part of the inverting amplifier, as its only function is to provide a high input impedance. The far left diagram shows the potentiometer split into two. It is simply a potential divider with two varying resistors, with the potentiometer setting indicated as alpha, which can vary from zero to one. The inverting amplifier is now in parallel with the lower resistor, and now there are two possible extreme cases to consider, over here and over here. So let's look at the middle diagram. If the potentiometer is turned completely to one side, alpha is zero, and thus the top resistor is R, and the bottom resistor is effectively a short. Since the short is in parallel with the high input impedance amplifier, the short dominates, and remembering basic potential divider theory, there is no voltage drop across the amplifier, as all of the input voltage is effectively dropped across R. No voltage at the input terminal of the amplifier means the signal won't be amplified, and V out will be zero. This is the case of infinite attenuation. Now let's look at the other case, the far right diagram. Now, if the potentiometer is turned completely to the other side, alpha is one, and the top resistor is now a short, with the bottom resistor being R. Now, all of the input signal voltage is apparent at the input terminal of the amplifier, and the voltage output will simply be minus K times V in, i.e. the maximum possible amplification. By going through the math, it turns out that the relationship between voltage gain and potentiometer setting, which is alpha, is this one over here, where alpha, again, goes between zero and one. Now, importantly, the gain is not a function of the total potentiometer resistance, but rather of alpha only. Here, I've graphed this function, so alpha on the x-axis and the gain on a linear scale on the y-axis. Now, if we plot that in decibels, we get a straight line which means we have a logarithmic response. And you can, as you can see, we have when alpha is zero, effectively infinite attenuation, and when alpha is one, we have about 15 decibels up here. And this is for an amplification of 5.6. Now returning back to our actual schematic, let's see if we can identify the path of the Baxendel volume control here. I've used this connector header to indicate the connection to the potentiometer. Then down here, we have our high input impedance unit to gain buffer. Here we have our inverting amplifier, again paralleled because we want to increase drive capability and reduce the noise. And finally, we have some sort of output buffer, which again inverts the signal. Because remember, the Baxendor active volume control is naturally inverting. So I'm inverting the signal again to remain the same phase as the input and the output. Some small notes. We have capacitors C10, C12, and C14, and these are there to ensure HF stability as they form a low-pass filter with the parallel resistances. Additionally, the maximum gain is set by R14 over R12, as well as R18 over R16. So 5.6 over 1, which is a gain of 15 at the maximum. And finally, we arrive at the output stage of the amplifier, which is to me the quirkiest part of the design. And this is the circuit diagram. So a bit daunting, but it's basically all the same thing. Let's have a look at the top left first, and the, I've called these the pre-drivers. Basically they're unity gain buffers, which feed the output drivers, since we have 12 of the output, and provide an interface between the volume control stage and the output stage. The actual output drivers are 12 paralleled unity gain voltage followers, which have their outputs summed together by one ohm current sharing resistors. Now a single NE5532 op-amp can quite comfortably drive about 13 volts peak into a 600 ohm load with minimal distortion. Now headphone amplifier voltages are comparatively much lower and combined with the fact that we have 12 op-amps driving one channel means the distortion will be rather low for nearly any expected volume level. Then finally, after all the summing of the op-amp stages, the output is fed through a current limiting resistor, which is this one here, the 10 ohm resistor, and then a very large electrolytic coupling capacitor to block any DC voltage from reaching the headphones. And the capacitor is this large as it also acts as a high pass filter in combination with the headphone impedance. For example, for 250 ohm headphones, uh, which is quite typical for studio headphones, the minus 3 dB cutoff is at 0.3 Hertz using this size capacitor, which is well below the audio band, and thus will not cause significant distortion. Uh, the final bleed resistor over here to ground ensures a discharge path for this large capacitor, should there be no headphones attached. 
And that pretty much sums up the schematic, so let's move over to the PCB layout and routing. Here we are in the KiCad 3D PCB viewer. And as I said before, this is a simple two-layer board, with the top and bottom looking like this. What I needed to do with this design is essentially split it in the middle, have one channel on the left and the other channel identical on the right. So essentially I've mirrored the layout and routing for each of these sides. I've used these screw terminal connectors to connect, for example, the DC power supply, as well as the line in and headphone out connections, as well as the stereo connections to the volume potentiometer. Of course, I could have incorporated this on the PCB, but I wasn't quite sure yet which enclosure I would use. Overall, the dimensions are about 60 by 80 millimeters. The PCB is roughly divided into power supply over here, then we have the input section and bias generators over here and here, and the final output sections left and right over here. Last but not least, I found a little very cheap enclosure for my headphone amplifier. I believe this is from Teco. It costs about four euros, so incredibly cheap. And in hindsight, I probably should have spent a tiny bit more money on it, as it had several gaps around the sides here and here. However, I just went along with it, drilled some holes and mounted the board, as well as connectors, switches, and an LED. So this is the raw enclosure. Then I printed out this little drill template which I made using draw.io. So once drilled, I mounted the PCB using PCB standoffs uh, to avoid contact between PCB pads and the case. I attached the various connectors and wired everything together. Uh, definitely not the neatest job by looking at this, but um, yeah, thankfully the case has a lid so you can't see it. And then finally, the final product sitting on my desk, which works surprisingly well and actually drives my biodynamic uh, DT880 Pros really well. Here's the NE5532 power amplifier I mentioned by Douglas Self. Uh, you can find it at Electro Magazine, and I believe you can also look at the Gerber files and some of the specifications of this amplifier. So I recommend you have a look at that because that's how I got inspired to make this headphone amplifier. I can really recommend Douglas Self's books in general, in particular the Small Signal Audio Design book, a really great book and definitely well worth the money. Thanks again for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe, leave a like if you like the video, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks again.